7. The Spirit and the Incarnation Although the Scripture presents the work of the Spirit as central to the Incarnation of our Lord, we too seldom think of Him in relation to that event. The celebration of Christmas commonly overlooks the Spirit. We have become so accustomed to our own preconceptions concerning the Spirit that we fail to see Him where He stands clearly and powerfully. Sweet stated very powerfully and clearly the work of the Spirit in the Incarnation. In this act, the Spirit is seen presiding over the beginning of a new creation. As in the beginning of cosmic life, as in the first quickening of the higher life in man, so at the outset of the new order which the Incarnation inaugurated, it belonged to the Divine Spirit to set in motion the great process which was to follow. In the new world, in the new man, as in the old, life begins with the breath of God, The birth of our Lord is not represented by the canonical Gospels as in itself miraculous or attended by any special signs of divine power. The miracle lay in the conception and not in the birth of Jesus. Birth followed under ordinary conditions. It was, however, preceded and followed by another outburst of prophecy. Matthew tells us in chapter 1, verse 18, that Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The facts are clear, but we have here a mystery beyond the limitations of our minds. The first person of the Trinity is called the Father by Jesus Christ, but it is the Holy Spirit who brought about the miraculous conception. In Luke's Gospel, This distinction is very clearly made by the angel Gabriel. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 37. The Holy Spirit is present at every step of the Incarnation. With Zacharias, Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25, verses 67 to 80. With John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verse 80. With Mary and Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56. And in the miraculous conception, Luke chapter 1, verse 35. At the first creation, when God made the heavens and the earth, the Spirit was present and active. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 Now, with the beginning of a new creation and a new humanity in the person of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is again present and active. The Spirit, thus, is basic to both creation and recreation. In either case, we have God's miraculous power at work, with the Spirit as the great mover. 
This fact is stressed by John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. But as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Our Lord, through the Virgin Mary, has a continuity with the original creation and with the original humanity of Adam. However, by his conception through the Holy Spirit, he is also a new creation. John writes with this in mind, in a clear reference to the virgin birth. Jesus Christ was born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John then compares the regeneration of all Christians to the virgin birth. It is not of man. It is the miraculous creation of a new humanity to be a people of God's new prince, his new Adam and Israel. This regeneration of man is totally of God, as was the virgin birth. Our Lord stresses this in John chapter 3 verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The water plainly signifies, among other things, baptism and our cleansing from and the forgiveness of our sins. But cleansing alone is not enough. The divine fiat, cleansing us from all our sin, leaves us sinners still if unaccompanied by our regeneration. This is the work of the Spirit, who moves upon the face of our sin and death to bring forth new life, righteousness, holiness, knowledge and dominion. Apart from this, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. To all these who are regenerated by the Spirit, God gives the power to become the sons of God. Power is exousia, privilege, right, authority. All such have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. What Christ is naturally, God's Son, we are by adoption, God's sons. Therefore, John declares joyfully, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Peter tells us that we are made partakers of the divine nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. That is, we now receive by grace the blessings of the life of the Trinity through the Holy Spirit. The virgin birth is a pattern of our rebirth. Our rebirth is from sin and death into life in Christ, into power. John chapter 1 verse 12. Our Lord carries the implications of this to startling lengths. According to his statement, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. First, these words precede the promise of the Spirit and are inseparable from it. John chapter 14, verse 26. As a result, the promise of greater works is wrongly read if we separate it from the coming of the Spirit. Second, our Lord sees these greater works done in and through us by the Spirit. The purpose thereof is the glorification of the Father in the Son. Because Jesus Christ makes us members of his body, his redeemed and new humanity, our, quote, greater works, end quote, 
are his glorification of the Father. Third, hence the importance of the asking in his name. To ask in his name is to ask in terms of his kingdom, work and life. Fourth, too often these, quote, greater works, end quote, are limited to Pentecost and its aftermath and to supernatural and miraculous events. They cannot be so limited. The work of our Lord was our salvation. Our work in him is discipling all the nations under him. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. The work of atonement is a finished work in Christ. The work of dominion continues to his coming again. There is no independence in these greater works. We work as members of the Son's new humanity in and through the Holy Spirit. We are given power in order that we may exercise dominion. Turning again to the Virgin Mary, we can see in both the Annunciation, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 37, and in the Magnificat, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55, why it is that the birth of our Lord is heralded as the beginning of a great overturning. The mighty of the old world of Adam the first are to be put down from the seats of power, and those whom the world despises as base and low are to be exalted. Luke chapter 1 verse 52, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 to 31. Thus, the great regeneration of all things is begun by the Holy Spirit with our Lord's virgin birth and is continued in and through us. God declares through Isaiah, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, compare chapter 66, verse 22, and through John, Behold, I make all things new. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. That new creation began with the birth of our Lord and was openly manifested by his resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. It continues to grow and spread through us. It is a work greater in scope. All the earth is to be brought under the dominion of Christ our Lord. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Psalm 72 verse 8. Compare Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10. The world hates this predicted victory and seeks to suppress it. In the 18th century, Catholic and Protestant monarchs did not want the Magnificat to be sung because of the verse. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Luke chapter 1 verse 52. Today, our humanistic rulers are trying to put down Christ and his kingdom. God laughs at their conspiracy and prepares to smash them. Psalm 2 verses 4 and 9. Christ, our conquering King, has come. Conceived of the Holy Ghost, he was crucified, dead and buried by the powers that be. But Christ is risen from the dead. Let the nations tremble. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12. 